Thank you, worship team. How about turning in your Bibles to Exodus 19? And going to need not the insert, but the sermon outline that's on the, on the side, on the, on the panel of the worship folder, okay? There's going to be some spaces to fill in as we go. Week two of a series called Fresh Start, talking about preparing for a blessing. Again, we're going to be in Exodus 19. I heard about a young man that was being dominated at home by his wife. And he went in for his yearly physical at work, and the doctor, the doctor was shocked at his appearance. The man had lost weight. He wouldn't or couldn't keep eye contact. It was like he was constantly cowering. So the doctor recommended a therapist who specialized in assertiveness training. And after one lesson, the same young man came home determined never to be the victim again. He stormed into the house and he walked up to his wife and putting a finger in his face, he said, from now on, I want you to know that I'm the man of the house and my word is law. I full well expect a hot dinner when I get home and dessert afterwards, you know, and then after dinner, uh, you're going to draw me my bath and so I can relax. And when I'm finished with my bath, guess who's going to dress me and comb my hair? And uh, the wife came right back up and said, the funeral director. <laughs> We're asking him to strengthen our hearts. And if we want that to go really well, we need to look at some things. Last week, we talked about how we need to, if you follow your outline, they're on there. Number one, how we need to look back and remember God's faithfulness. We read from Exodus 19 and saw how God, in helping to get his people ready to receive him and his word, he told them to remember his previous faithfulness among them. He said, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. We read from that beautiful passage in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. Remember that. Remember he is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. If we're serious about receiving a blessing from God, we need to look back and remember his faithfulness. Then we need to look ahead and celebrate our future. We celebrate, and that's the right word, we celebrate the fact that God has already chosen us as his cherished possession and chosen priests. Those titles are ours because of him, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We look back, we look forward, we look around. Because of the confidence in not only what he has done, but what he will do, we look around and it's like we nod. We, in agreement, we commit with the congregation. And to do that rightly with the congregation, here we go, this is today. Then individually, each one of us needs to, number four on your outlines, look inward and prepare yourself spiritually. Listen to the word of God again in Exodus 19 says, verses 10 and 11, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. I'm from St. Louis. I really want to say wash, but I'm trying. All right? Wash your clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Tucked in these verses are three very practical steps you and I can take to get ready spiritually for what God wants to do within us. Here's number one. Set aside time. God says to his people, I want you to take the days that lay immediately before us, before us and I want you to get ready to meet with me. As we hear this, please remember, these people are just like us. They have 
they have responsibilities and they have families to take care of and they got to do this, you know. And yet God says, this is important enough that I want you to carve out time to be involved in meeting me. The second thing you can do to spiritually prepare is to take, write it in, inventory. When a business does an inventory, in reality, it's, um, in a way, it's a reality check. It's, it's saying, here's what we have and here's what we don't have. And what I'm asking you to do is to do the same thing spiritually. I want you to take a spiritual inventory, an honest assessment, and just ask the hard question, where am I with the Lord right now in my own relationship? If I want to be in the right place in my heart in order to let God to do a great work in my life, I need to have an honest assessment about my relationship to, with God. Now, there's a great passage in Revelation chapter 2 where the Lord is speaking to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus the Ephesian church was a very busy church, and they were active with some very successful ministry in it. But God looked at the church and says, I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. That had to hurt. I mean, that don't want to hear that. And if we're honest with him, what we hear, it might hurt for a time. But the truth is, in a congregation of this size, with this many people, even though outwardly we may be very busy and involved in church, for some of us, the fact is, our hearts have drifted in a relationship with God. And this is just one of those times where heading into a new season. It's a built-in time for us to just stop and ask, is there anything that's blocking my relationship with God? Is there some sin that I've been clinging to? Or have I just drifted and I need to come back in my relationship with God? I, I hope your heart's cry is the cry of David in Psalms 51 verse 10 when he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. And I love this last part. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's a good prayer. Look inward, set aside time, take inventory, and then maybe most importantly, pray diligently. Nothing is going to draw our heart to God's heart like prayer. Nothing is going to remove spiritual obstacles and roadblocks like prayer. Nothing is going to reignite our love relationship with God like time alone and just talking with him. Nothing will invite the presence of God like a congregation who is committed to praying. And nothing will set a table for a God blessing more than, than prayer. I long for our congregation and myself to grow deeper in prayer during this time immediately before us. Deuteronomy 4, 7 ought to be talking about us. What other nation, what other group of people, congregation, is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. We ought to be the first upon our knees together. Number five, after everything we've talked about, last one, look up and get ready for a God encounter. The Bible says, Exodus 9, 19, verse 16 and following, On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Can you see it in your head? 
And right in the middle of all that, it says, Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And I don't think it's stretching anything to say that often the most life-altering encounters with God require us to leave the routine, to leave the comfortable, and leave the familiar. I have no doubt that we're going to be asking some of you to do something or some things you're not comfortable with over the next couple weeks. And that's okay. Because I know that he's worth it and what he wants to offer us, what he wants to offer you, is guaranteed worth it. And to get that, the best of that, some of you are going to have to try this small group thing. Make room in your world for some relationships and the opportunity for him to talk to you and use you through other people. For some, it might mean taking the risk to open your home to a group. For some, it will mean moving outside your comfort zone and beginning to begin to serve people in or out of our community who are in need. But right now, I want you to imagine the scene standing in front of Mount Sinai. Two million people, men, women, and children alike. And the Bible says that God came down. Here's how it describes it in Exodus 20, verse 18. It says, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the horn, they saw the lightning and smoke billowing from the mountain. They stood at a distance, trembling with fear. You know, when God comes down, it seems like the only real appropriate response is what we might call humble reverence. We get quiet. We bow down. We get real. Because it's in those moments we're reminded how small we are and how big and powerful and glorious he is. I don't know about you, but every time I, I, I think of a situation like this, it reminds me of the story we've gone over before, Mark chapter 4, when after a time of ministry, Jesus says, let's get in a boat and go to the other side of the lake. And they got in the boat and promptly he went in the back of the boat and got a cushion and went to sleep and they're making their way across the lake, and the scripture says a squall. I think it should say a doggone big storm came up, but a squall came up, you know. And the wind began to howl, and the waves were so high, the water began to break into the boat. And it was filling the boat with water, and finally, in panic, in a dis desperation, and yes, frustration, the disciples wake up Jesus, and they say to him, don't you care that we're about to drown? And the Bible says that Jesus woke up and he stood up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the water, be still. And the wind stopped and the waves died. And it says in scripture that the disciples were terrified. Because while it's scary to have water in your boat, it's a whole lot more scarier to have God in your boat, right? You know? <laughs> and when you have these kind of God encounters, It ought to move us. It ought to leave, leave us in awe. And I want to, as I close, I want to move, I want to fast forward 40 years later. And Moses is challenging the people as they're about ready to enter the promised land. And finally, they're here. Moses is not going with them, but he begins to warn them and gives them instruction. And he says, when you cross the Jordan and you get on the other side and, and life gets good and easy and comfortable and prosperous, he says, don't forget God. Don't forget everything he has done for you. And then he says, be sure and pass on to your kids and your grandkids all that God has done, the stories of faith and how he has worked. In Deuteronomy 4.10, he says, make sure you tell them about the day you stood before the Lord your God at the mountain. Forty years later, Moses points back to Exodus 19 as one of those defining moments in the history of the nation of Israel. 
40 years later, he points back and says, don't forget to tell your kids and grandkids about the day God came down. So my mind jumps to somewhere in the near future or maybe even decades down the road. Wouldn't it be great if we could sit with our kids and our grandkids and say, there was a time when I got real serious about asking God to strengthen my heart. And kids, you can know this about God. He keeps his word. He keeps his word. Wouldn't that be great if that was, if that became our story about God? Now, some of you don't have nearly that big of an expect expectation, you know. To be honest, you're not seriously looking for life change right now. But I tell you, he's that big of a God. He can change you. He can change us. He could change forever the eternal destiny of some of those around us. I want us to use this time to pray for a fresh start. I want us to prepare for a blessing from God. I want us to seek him out together because that God that we come to worship together, he shows up. He keeps his word. He's that kind of God. We started a couple weeks ago with this passage, 2 Chronicles, anybody remember? 16.9, who is the one good person? All right, thank you very much. Everybody, look at her, she gets brownie points. All right, 2 Chronicles 16.9, this is what it says. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Why not us? Why not you? Why not me? Let's pray. Father, it comes down to this. Whatever needs to happen so that we may encounter you like this for the first time or again and walk forward with you. Show us, reveal to us, prompt us, move us. May you find us responding to you, please. Lord, we know enough here to know that it's going to involve spending time with you. We can't, we can't, we don't want to do this without you. So please help it to start right there. Give us the confidence to trust you in the process might have to move out in some areas that aren't entirely comfortable, but we can, you're there ahead of us. We can trust you. Lord, what moves our heart, may it be your faithfulness, your word, your promise. And may you Show yourself strong in this behalf of this congregation and individuals. Strengthen our hearts, Lord, please. May we be that people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Always starts with God and what he's done with us through Jesus Christ. Going to ask our prayer partners to come up. You might want to pray that you're going to respond to his prompting. We're going to sing a song, Thou Art Worthy, which is very, very appropriate. Um, if you need to, just sit where you are and start your conversation with him now. But let's make sure that we're allowing him to move our hearts. Let's stand. Let's sing.